Hey there, this is Schwermetallisch. I'm sitting here with Tony Dolan of Wenham Inc. and, of course, uh, Zabatonero. Hey, Tony. Hey, how are you? Nice to see you, Dennis. Oh, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> I just uh, got, a, got a little time after work and I'm working later on and it's, it's all very <laughs> packed. Perfect. This is a well, packed Monday. Given, given the pandemic, that's a good thing that people are still finding ways to be a bit normal in this crazy world. Yeah, I can tell you, uh, with with my my uh, blog and the, the reviews and all that, it, it's it's been a grind since May 2019. <laughs> yeah, busy, busy. I have to say, I have to say, you know, when when um, the pandemic began and they said there would be no live shows, I was thinking, wow, it's going to be kind of hard uh, to to make things happen. But you know, uh, we're finishing. I'm fi just finished the vocals on the new Venom Inc. album. Mantis is mixing that now. Sabatinero came along and we had I had this idea to make it a whole album for for workers so you know and and I've been doing guest spots I, and I kind of I've probably been more busy in, in lockdown than I was normally so it's kind of a crazy world a crazy world yeah it, it, with me well it was like uh, I was searching for ways to distract me from yeah the boredom and uh, yeah. Yeah. all the sorrows and shit like that and you do it for for a short amount of time and then there, there's coming work from from every direction everywhere yeah yeah <laughs> I, think I, that's that's awesome. a, I think that's an amazing thing you know you know when, when you would do an interview before people would say what do you think about music on the internet and how is the internet with streaming and how does it all and now people have, have realized that how much a, a, a massive part of everything the internet has become and how much work you can actually do if you utilize uh, if you utilize that technology properly where yes you know, yes yes before it's just you know checking a couple of instagram messages or facebook posting and stuff whereas actually you can use it really well to communicate across the planet really well really quickly so it's, it's a, an amazing tool Yes, that, that, that is correct. <laughs> so, uh, Sabo Tornero is, is, a, is an all-star project. Uh, maybe a dumb question, but uh, um, why did you choose the, uh, for, for this charity project the Italian COVID workers as an Englishman? Well, you know, when what happened was during lockdown, every all musicians and friends of mine, you know, we were all doing kind of projects where someone would go, let's do a recording. You know, I did a Metallica one for Metal Injection and I did something for Brazil and, and I was doing a lot and so with friends of mine. Um, and and uh, the uh, Francesco uh, Conte contacted me and said, oh, we, we're doing um, Hole in the Sky, you know, Black Sabbath, and we wondered if you'd uh, like play bass on it. And I was like, yeah, sure. And then... You know, we recorded it. I recorded the bass in London, sent it over, they mixed it, and then we did like a split screen, typical thing that everybody was doing of us in our own places playing the song. And But I really, I'm a huge Sabbath fan, and I really loved uh, playing it, you know, playing Giza Butlerpot. And then I thought, at that time, Italy had been, you know, had been really hit hard. And the rest of the world in the West, we were thinking... You know, that's really bad, but we're going to protect ourselves. We'll be okay. We'll block flights. And so we were all kidding ourselves that the pandemic had affected Iran, had affected Italy, but we weren't going to be as affected, of course. So I decided then, after, you know, wh why don't we do some more Black Sabbath songs? And I was like, we could do an album and maybe get, I could get some friends and we could get some guests and we could raise some money to give to Italy. Uh, of course, it took us around about a year to do the whole project, and by that point, the world was on fire. There was yeah. nobody was safe. You know, everybody had it, and and so it. it but it, it began at the moment that Italy was the worst affected, and um, and they were really suffering. So that's where the project came out of. But subsequently, you know, in 2022, I planned taking it out on the road. And uh, and all of the artists will, will perform with their bands, and we will we will go to those places that have been really badly hit, and we will donate um, 
20% uh, uh, of everything to that locale and then send 20% back to Italy uh, to the hospital that we started at. So, you know, it actually, I found a way that we can embrace everybody in it, you know, and, and help as many people as we can, hopefully. That is great. Yeah, I always uh, wanted to, to do something, but but I'm uh, yeah, my, my platform is not very very big, so I, all I can do is just uh, share links around and uh, I don't know. Uh, um, I think that I think you know yeah. it's, I think that that's enough. You know, you can. It's like you know, um, you know, I was in India once on tour with the Royal Shakespeare Company uh, as a technician and. And um, the, the, the people were begging, the kids would beg all the time. And, and outside of our hotel was one girl who used to carry a small baby and beg. And I used to give uh, some money. And then someone said to me, you know, you can't change the world. You know, these kids get pimped out. So I thought, oh, okay, well, okay. Um, so then I began to take her to a store and buy baby milk and stuff like that because it was obviously her child, you know. And... And those people were going, yeah, but even that, you know, you're not going to change. I said, yeah, but can I just say that we've been here for six weeks and every day I've given her some money for some food and now I'm buying her food for her baby and sandwiches for her and you haven't done anything. So maybe I can't change the world, but I can do something. And I and, and I think that's it, Dennis. We can all do whatever we can do. And if that's sharing a link and and and, and or just reaching out to someone and listening to them, It's something. We can all do something. And, and anything small is still a value. It's still a value, I think. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. <laughs> it really is. I, I, I really do share quite a lot, but <coughs> it, all, it always feels like, a, like a, you're, you're it, not you, doing it, enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's like, you know, it's like, um, it's like your ship. Uh, filling up with water and you've only got like a teaspoon to empty the water <laughs> at, you know but if everybody yeah. has a teaspoon and everybody does it you know you, you might have a chance and i think it's as simple as that you know even even with venom uh, uh, and venom ink you know we would get stories when i was out on the road where people would say you know your music saved saved me from whatever it was or helped me through this a cancer or a death or of a family member or a breakup and stuff and you're thinking wow so you know satanicist or or metal we bleed or are they satanists or sons of satan helped you through that but it's the power of the music so you know sometimes you don't realize that that even just listening to someone or sharing something for them on their behalf uh, is significant you know it's significant um it feels like a ripple but you know a butterfly sort of flaps its wings in in the you know in japan and there's a fucking tidal wave in brazil you know it's that kind of thing I think. yeah I, i i get what what you uh, what you mean so uh you you played in venom uh from 89 to to 92 before leaving is it yeah. okay to ask you why you left yes it's fine you can ask me <laughs> so why <laughs> oh you did okay <laughs> no um Yeah, I think it was just the end of a progression. You know, by the time, you know, I went into Venom because they were friends of mine. We were all friends and we were on the same label and, and I knew the band. And, and when they needed someone to replace uh, uh, Kronos, it was uh, I was the obvious choice, I guess, because I was the biggest fan. I knew the material, I could play bass, I could sing the songs and, and I knew them. Uh, but I think by 92, I think that the whole heavy metal scene seen in 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 the world but but certainly in the uk was really under uh, under the hammer let's say because um we had brit pop so we had blur and oasis and the indie scene and of course from america there was a huge move with grunge you know there were uh, you know the never on a pearl jam all that kind of stuff so it seemed like heavy metal wasn't really uh doing the same kind of business and uh, you know i've been i've been a, a, um, a huge a fan of that type of music and I just thought you know Venom in particular had, had uh, been so huge when they began uh, and such an influential thing of breaking down barriers and, and making bands realize they could do more than they thought they could do just by doing it uh, that um, by 92 I didn't want the band to be just like nailed into a coffin 
as an irrelevant. And it seemed to me that that's what was happening because it was like flogging a dead horse. The, the, yeah. And why continue just because? You know, Metallica, they did load and reload and put some makeup on and cut their hair and they found their way through that whole event. You know, but thankfully, and I'm not saying that was bad, uh, you know, I like their albums, but thankfully, you all of a sudden, Pantera blew up and then Black Metal blew up and Metal came back bigger than ever, you know, uh, in the genre. So I think that mm, the reinvention of Venom had to happen. Uh, and that period for me between 92 and into the 2000s, you know, it was a quiet period, but it should have been, you know, there's no point in just making albums just because you can um, to, for nobody to listen to. So there, there wasn't any point for me. Uh, so I, I, I moved uh, to London and, and just carried on with my um, acting and my technical stuff, my day job. Is yeah, I got a, I got a question uh, to, to, the, to the acting uh, part. Okay. Of course, uh, I am of course a big fan of uh, 2000 AD. And ah. you, you really? Is it is it true that you played a part in the movie Judge Dredd? Yes, but you know it's quite strange because when I was working for the Royal Shakespeare Company, when I moved to London, I was working as a technician, and we did a tour around the world, and uh, it was a Shakespeare play, of course, and uh, we had a problem in India. Uh, one of the cast was sick, so they, they came to me and said, we have a problem, one of the cast can't go on tonight. But you know this play very well, because I, I, I used to quote all the time in the show. And I said, yeah, and I went, but I don't know anybody, we're in India. And they said, well, what are you doing? And I was like, what? They said, yeah, go on stage tonight and, and fill in the actor's part. And I was like, fuck, I've never, I've never been on stage as an actor in my life. Um, but I thought, fuck it, why not? So I did, I had a good time, I really enjoyed it. And then um, the director asked me to do it again when we returned to London a year later. And so I went and did it. And then I thought, okay, maybe I should do some more of this. So I, I went to see two agents. And the first one said, you know, you're too old. You haven't got any experience. You haven't been trained. So it's not going to happen. The second one I went and said, yeah, I love it. Yeah, great. Let's do something. And a week later, I was auditioning for First Night, which was a movie that Richard Gere did with Sean Connery, thinking, oh, fuck, how did I do this? And the week after that, I got a part in Judge Dredd as one of the uh, 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 Aspen prisoners who were going to hijack Dredd and, and try to kill him, you know. Um, and so the, about two weeks after, so within like two months of me thinking, oh, that was kind of fun, I was sitting on a shuttle on an Aspen shuttle prison in Judge Dredd next to Rob Schneider and, and Sylvester Stallone thinking, this is fucking weird. How did this happen? And, you know, you know, years later, when people go to me, so how did you get into that? I was going, I've got no idea. I just, it just happened. I, I didn't plan it. I didn't think, oh, I want to be an actor. I want to make loads, a million. I just said yes to an opportunity. And that led to another one, which I said yes to. And that's kind of how it happened. You know, weird, weird. Great story. <laughs> Thank that's you. for sure. It was amazing, you know, and, and of course, Rocky, the film Rocky, like two, two things that really set me on my path to go, you know, you can do it, was uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, who I was a huge fan of, and he wrote a book called The Encyclopedia of a Bodybuilder, and, I, uh, and he, he wrote a paperback book, which I bought in New York once for four dollars or two dollars, and I kept it as my Bible because it was very inspirational. And the other thing was the Rocky movie, the first Rocky movie and how Stallone had that made. So being being on set with him, I got a chance to ask him, you know? I was like, wow, man, Rocky, and you work with Roberto Duran, and what, you know, and, and he was brilliant. He was brilliant. He just chatted and, uh, you know, and even to this day, even though telling you about that, with 2018 and that whole movie, it got panned, it didn't do very well, but that was because Synergy, the American studio, didn't want too much violence because they wanted to sell it to like a young audience in America. And America, <coughs> uh, two, like 2018 wasn't so Dark Horse and those comics, they weren't that popular. You know, it was more Marvel, of course, and DC. So it wasn't, it, it wasn't as well known. Um, so they, they wanted to dampen it down, so lots of stuff got cut out. I, I took people in London to see the premiere, I was so excited. 
And I said, yeah, we did all this cool stuff. And then in the movie, it's not, nothing's there. And I, I'd never done a movie, so I was like, I don't understand where my stuff is. And they were going, you weren't really in it. I was going, I was, I was, I was. There was loads in it. So, um, but they kept the death scene. But I, um, you know, as you know, if you've seen the movie, Judge Dredd just not never takes his helmet off. And of course, yeah. it was Sylvester Stallone. It was Hollywood. So as soon as they got into the movie, they went, we want hit them to take his helmet off as fast as possible. And I remember there was about 2,000 people in the cinema in Leicester Square in London at the premiere. And as soon as you saw him start to take his helmet off, he was like 2,000 people going, boo! You know, <laughs> all huge fans, but yeah. It was that, 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 that would be my reaction too. <laughs> yeah, mine too. It was like, oh, what? Yeah. Just, yeah. Did, did you see, uh, see the the new interpretation, dress? Yeah, yeah. That, that, that was, was much more, much more true to the comic. Much more true. Yeah. Yeah, I really, I, I think I already saw it ten or twelve times. <laughs> yeah. You know what's 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 um what's unfair though is that Danny Cannon. Um, you know, he he was a huge 2000 AD fan as the director, which is why the studio got him. But then they they wouldn't agree with when he was trying to tell them, no, we can't do that because this is how the story is. They just refused to listen. They just wanted to sell their superstar, and that's all it was, you know. And um, and so I felt I felt kind of you know, that the fans got jipped a bit, but also that Danny Cannon, who directed it, also got jipped because he didn't get to show the film that he wanted to make, which was traditional and re true to the story. So it's a bit of a shame, but it was fun to do, yeah. fun to do. I can, yeah. I can say Armand de Santi, who plays the, you know, Dredd's brother, is the most amazing but crazy guy. In, in, I've never met in my life. When you look into his eyes, you think he could murder someone real easy and still go just take a coffee and not be worried about it. He's like nuts, but amazing, yeah. Rico. Rico, exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, aside from, from, from being an actor, um, you played in many bands and acted in a few movies. Uh, are you a workaholic? Yes. That's the, sh the short answer is yes. Gotcha. I am. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, you know, I don't kind of because I work in the, as a as an automation technician and I was trained as a master carpenter, you know, and a welder, and uh, I did music because of the north of England where I came from was very poor, very working class, and I and I didn't want to do what my father had did in his family. He didn't just you know, drink and smoke and die working in industry. So I thought there's got to be something else. And I wanted to see the world. And so music allowed me the opportunity to, to see the world and to taste food and to travel and language and meet people. And so that's what inspired me really, just to, to try and live life a little bit and, and see the planet, you know? So I've been very fortunate. But along the way, I thought, you know, um, and like I used to teach my students, there's opportunities that come. Always say yes, because then you don't know. If someone goes, do you want to skydive? Just say yes. You can always say no when you get up there and you shit your pants and go, I'm not jumping out of a plane. But it, you don't know until you get there. If you say no, and the plane goes up and everybody jumps out and says how amazing it was, and you might not get another chance to do it. So say yes first, challenge yourself, see where your limits are, um, and then you can reevaluate later. So I kind of, I kind of do that every day. I try and find something stimulating, something I can do, something new. If it's a way to help, like Sabatinero, you know, where I get to play Black Sabbath, but we also get to do some for Cool for Trality. But I also get to play with amazing musicians from my, you know, from my community. Then, then I'll do it, you know. And um, but I always try and, and challenge myself all the time. And so I guess that turns out that you're a workaholic because my days run, you know, because Japan is a, year, is a day ahead and the West Coast of America is eight hours behind, so half a day behind. So therefore, I'm 24 hours, seven days a week. But, but I love that. I love that, you know. I, uh, I know Mantis, for example, lives in Portugal and he likes quiet, nobody around. He likes to take his tea and go for long walks, nice and slow. He wants his day 
full of sunshine and doing doing very very little to enjoying his set time. But I like to be in the middle of a city where the shit's hitting the fan and people are stealing stuff. There's drugs. It's crazy. There's cops. There's like ah. I, I love all that excitement that humans are. You know, I I love that. I I, I miss stuff that I really hated two years ago, like like uh, crowds. Just just being yeah. in a crowd of people yeah. and and maybe at a, at a, at a gig just uh, punching absolutely, through absolutely. To, to get in the first row. I never did that because I hated to be in the crowd yeah. and I didn't no, want to be in the first row. And now all I want is to, to be in a smoky bar or uh, yeah. in a club just to... Uh, yeah. yeah. No, I think, uh, you know, I... I, I um, You know, because I kind of live my life when we're on the road, so that's when I kind of drink and do all my stuff and go to bars or whatever because we play. I said, but you know, when I come home, I never go to pubs. I don't really hang out with people per se. You know, I don't, I don't do that kind of stuff. Um, but all I want to do is go to a pub. That's all I mean. I would just want to go to a pub and drink beer, and I don't care how long it takes me to get one. I want it to be full. So exactly like you, you know. And I think that's. One of the, the the plus things of the pandemic, it's made us reevaluate those things that would piss us off with a crowded train or or a queue. With a, but it, it, it's it's humanity, and it kind of gets us to reevaluate the things that even stuff we didn't do. You know, like uh, uh, I go swimming a lot, but I know someone said to me, "I really want to go swimming," and I was like, "Yeah, me too. I miss it so much." I said, "I didn't realize you swam a lot." They went, "I don't," but I just want to go to a swimming pool and have a swim because I didn't do it before, but I want to do it now, and I think that's the same thing. You know, stuff stuff that we didn't do, we realize we just took for granted, and then when it's taken away from us, you know, you want to do it. You want to do it. You know? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, I, I got one final question, mm -hmm. and then I, I gotta run and, and jump no and, and leave. <laughs> no um, yeah, who did the awesome cover artwork for the Sepulchre Nero? Uh, yeah. Well, that record. was done by the the logo was done by uh, a wonderful uh, uh, artist, uh, singer, um, tattoo artist called uh, Maximina Kzianik. She's uh, Polish. She actually. Um, Uh, was in a Polish band. She's now in a band called Smoke Rights, but she she um, she designed the logo for me, and that's that's uh, her her work there. And um, yeah, and the 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 artwork was a, a, a guy called Velt Yama, who's a tattoo artist who's done you know tattoos on me, and uh, he's he's from Rome, and his his studio is very near the Colise Colosseum. So yeah. whenever I would go, if you we were playing a show, I'd go see him. He'd put a new tattoo on and, and uh, you know, he was always doing artwork. And I thought, look, this is for Italian workers. So the more Italians I have, you know, artisans, musicians, uh, artists, the better it is. So I thought, who should we do the cover? Why not an Italian tattoo artist? You know, because I think that in Italy, the government has a, has a, a looks down their nose on rock and heavy metal and also tattooing and piercing. So it's part of their culture to think that's uncultured, you know, because Italian is fine wine and cheeses and opera and, you know, uh, um, Michelangelo, Da Vinci. Culture. Culture. But what I'm trying to present is, this is what you think is bad influence and subculture, but this is your new Italy. These these are the new uh, da, da Vinci's and, and Michelangelo's. This is your new, new opera. It may sound like it's death metal or, or, or black metal, but it's it's your new opera. And so, yeah, so I asked Veld Yama, would he design the cover um, and put Maple Durham, which is from the first Black Sabbath, uh, uh, which is not far from where I am right now, um, put that somehow in the cover. So he took the witch from the cover of Black Sabbath. He kind of made her a bit nuts and we put Maple Durham, the, the uh, watermill in there. And, Yeah, he came up with a wonderful piece, I, I, and, and in his very uh, Italian style. So, yeah, I'm very proud that I got him to do the cover. So it, it, it does look great. Of, 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 yeah, that, that's for sure. Ah, <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, thank you.
And you know, I really, really all like the it. Artists, you know, all the artists uh, donated for free from Marty Friedman, you know, to uh, Terence Hobbs, James Murphy. And my, my whole point, I, want, I just want to get this across. I know you got to go, Den, but just to say that, you know, each track was approached very differently. All, all on to honor Black Sabbath because they're amazing musicians and they create this 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 incredible music. But I wanted to show that they influence all of all of the music that we categorize now. So I have very young uh, musicians on there who are some are, are not so well known, older musicians who are very well known, bands that are very well known, bands that are not known, upcoming bands, and I've crossed all genres. I've got thrash, black metal, heavy metal, death metal, new wave of British heavy metal, solo artists, you know, so I tried to I tried to take in everything that makes up our metal community and, and put that into the album. Just to say that we're not trying to be Black Sabbath. It, it's like the reason that these musicians exist doing what they do is because Black Sabbath was an influence for them. And this is them honoring, being who they are in their genre, but honoring um, that amazing band and that was it. And. You know, the first response I got was from Giza Butler, who just, on Symptoms of the Universe, and just said, you know, this is an exceptional version. And then he posted it on his Twitter feed and on his Facebook. So I thought, you know, that's an amazing... I, I, I never dreamt that I would get a message from Tony Iommi or Giza Butler, who wrote it, saying, really well done. This is, like, great stuff. So I'm very, very proud of everybody and everything we did. You can't have any better advertisement. None, none, none. And, nope. and, and the whole idea is to eventually, if we can, is just to get people to buy it. The pricing's really small, just to go, you're actually donating to something from from our metal community across the planet, you know? And, and there will be something on there you like, there'll be a version on there you like, um, but you, it's doing something good. You know, it's not just putting some money in an envelope or throwing it in a tin or a bucket in a, in a street market. This is actually, you know, sharing something uh, together and at the same time doing something good for, for some people who really suffered. Yeah, I will, uh, I will um, hit you up when uh, I know when, when the interview is, uh, is online. It will, it will be on YouTube, so uh, yeah, we we will we get some uh, some people to watch it. I uh, hope. I uh, well, I'll help, and so will Time to Kill. We'll go. Uh, 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 we'll we'll uh, um, we'll all try as hard as we can, and, and let's get some people seeing it and and supporting us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your time, Tony, and uh, have a have a nice day, and uh, yeah. If if I have more time, we we can do another one when when it's out. Uh, maybe maybe when you uh, when you have some some numbers and yeah. uh, that, that that would be that would be great. Let's do it again. And don't forget, you know, it, we uh, we're delivering the new Venom Inc. album goes this month to Nuclear Blast, so we we have that too. So let's have yeah, let's have a, a nice old chat when we got some more time, and and we'll do it again. Yeah, maybe I will review that so we have uh, a, a bit more to talk. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, if you and if you don't, then don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, that's brilliant. All right. See you. Thanks, Dennis. Be good. See you next See time. You later. Ciao, ciao. Cheers. Bye. Cheers.